I want to uh, thank Mark for uh, bringing the first part of our sermon this morning. Um, that is really what I asked him to do uh, because uh, exhorting the congregation to be doers of the word and not hearers only is such a, a key part of of what our task in preaching is. And I would really encourage all of you to heed uh, the exhortation that, that Brother Mark uh, brought and follow the good example, the wonderful example that he sets in personal evangelism. It is our mission. That's why we exist here in the world. And so let's be active in taking that good news that's in those baskets and sharing them uh, with the lost. Uh, you know, Easter is a time which people are unusually open. Let's utilize it. And by the way, wasn't it wonderful to have our children and our teens uh, just today, our teens this morning, and then our children tonight leading us in praise? Uh, I was reflecting on Palm Sunday this week, and I was reminded that in Matthew 21, verses 15 through 16, as Jesus comes in to Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, and all of them, everyone's putting the palm branches down and the cloaks down before him, and they're shouting Hosanna in the highest, that then it says later on that in the temple, it says that there were children who were shouting out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. And then the Pharisees got indignant over it, and they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And then it says in Matthew 21, verse 16, Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. So what a, an appropriate thing it has been to have our teens this morning and then our children tonight leading us in praise, saying, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I'm so excited about these coming weeks in the life of our church. We have on Good Friday, our, our brothers and sisters from Berean Baptist will be joining us as we celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ and his death. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we're hoping to have many, many unbelievers here to hear the good news of the gospel and then to try to bridge to that to Christianity Explored so that they can come to faith in Christ. And then on April 9th, we have a men's retreat. Men, you can sign up in the fellowship hall. There are just so many exciting things that the Lord is doing in our, uh, the life of our church. And I pray that you'll be active in taking advantage of all of them. I want to invite you now to turn uh, back to Ephesians 1. We're going to continue our study, and, and we're concluding this section on praise. If you remember, we've been talking about how verses 3 through 14 are all in the form of a praise hymn, basically an expression of why we praise God. And on a day like Palm Sunday, where the theme is worshiping God, it's very appropriate that we would come then to the conclusion of this section, which has been giving us reasons to praise God. You know, when the crowds were welcoming Christ in and they were saying, Hosanna in the highest, and the children were crying out, they were praising him. They were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is the son of David. He is the messianic king promised in the Old Testament who now is entering Jerusalem and about to give his life for the sins of the world. So we come to this section reminded that the things that they cry out is what the application is going to be for us this morning. Our hearts should respond in worship and praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we kind of launch into this, if you remember, we've been talking about what God the Father did for us in eternity past, what God the Son is doing for us in the present. And then this morning we're concluding by focusing on verses 13 through 14, which focus on what God the Holy Spirit is doing and will do for us in the future. Read with me together Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. It says, In him, that is in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. Right, this is that focus on what God, the Holy Spirit, does for us. Now, the first thing that jumps out from us, that should jump out for, for, uh, to us in verse 13, is the words, you also, you also. You also. 
There's a change from the first person plural, the words we and our and us, that have occurred repeatedly in verses 3 through 12, to now a second person plural, the word you, at the beginning of verse 13. This should really jump out to us. Paul's been saying we have, we have, our, we, are, us. And now all of a sudden we meet this first word, you. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And then if you look back to, in verse 14, he switches back to we, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. So what is the deal with this change from the we to the you and then back to we? It is very significant, so I want to look at it with you pretty extensively this morning. Look at verse 13. It says, in him you also. Now that word also is pointing us back to something that was said in verse 12. Look back at verse 12. It says, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also. So we have the we who were the first to hope in Christ in verse 12. And then you who also believed. So who does the we in verse 12 refer to? And then what does the switch to the you in verse 13 mean? What is the significance of this switch between we and you. Now, this is a situation where there's some disagreement in, in, amongst good biblical teachers on this. Some say that this is just kind of stylistic. It, does, it doesn't really have much of a meaning. Paul's just kind of switching back and forth in kind of normal letter writing form, and there's not really much significance to it. But the majority of commentators that I read, and as I studied this for several hours this week, I came to the conclusion that it is very significant. There's a very significant switch from the we in verse 12 to the you in verse 13. Because Paul is contrasting Jew and Gentile and indicating that the Gentiles now have been grafted in, as he taught elsewhere, especially in the book of Romans, have been grafted into the vine of the Messiah and therefore partake of salvation together with the old covenant believers. And the Jews and Gentiles now have been united in one body in Christ. One of the major themes that we talked about in the book is that God has united people from every nation and tribe and tongue and language into one body, the church. Look over at chapter 2, verse 11. We're going to see a clear usage of a second person plural, you, right, to distinguish believing Gentiles from the first person plural, we, that Paul uses to refer to himself and to fellow Jewish believers. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Therefore remember that formerly you, there's that second plural, the Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Right? So here's a very clear use of the word you and very clearly referring to Gentiles. And so it is clear that Paul uses you to refer to the primarily Gentile Ephesian church And then in our context in chapter 1, verse 12, he refers to the we, is referring to himself and the primarily Jewish early disciples. Now that raises an immediate question, or at least it should in your mind. When you look at chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and we see all of the we's, right, in verse 3, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. As he chose us, verse 4, verse 5, he predestined us to the praise of the glory of his grace. In him we have redemption, verse 7. Verse 8, he lavished his grace on us. Are all of those we's in us, do they only then pertain to the Jews? Do they only apply to the old covenant Jews who were, as verse 12 says, the first to hope in the Messiah? It's interesting in verse 12 when it says, we who were the first to hope in Christ, there's an article, the word the in Greek, before Christ. It's literally, we who were the first to hope in the Messiah. 
right? And Paul is referring to himself and to Jewish believers who were the first to hope in the Messiah. So do all of the blessings in earlier verses then not apply to all believers? Do they only apply then to the Jewish early believers? The answer is no. Look back to the greeting in in chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. The blessings in verses 3 through 12 apply to all Christians, and it's clear through the greeting. He introduced himself, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he continues, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So from the greeting, you see that the you and the us is merged together and then he is talking in following verses about all the blessings that Christ has poured out upon all of us, all Christians. So you have this inclusion of all believers in all of the blessings that we find listed in verses 3 all the way down through verse 11. It is only in verse 12 in which the word we has a modifier added, right? A, A narrowing distinguisher, right? In verse 12 he says, to the end that we, now not not we everybody, all Christians, but we, now more specifically, who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. So now he's narrowing the focus from all Christians to a comparison of two different subgroups within that greater group. The group that Christ united in Christ is comprised of two types or categories of people. Jews who were the first to hope in the Messiah and then the Gentiles who, verse 13 says, also heard and believe the message about Christ. As I studied the, how Paul uses we and you throughout the book of Ephesians, there was a really clear pattern that emerged. And I wanted to just show this to you because in your own Bible reading, I think this will help to kind of guide you interpretively. When Paul in Ephesians uses the first person plural, right, the words we or our or us, without any modifiers, he is referring to all Christians. But when he adds an explanatory modifier, something that narrows the focus, he is referring to himself and the primarily Jewish early believers who were the first to hope in the Messiah. And that's what he's doing here in verse 13. And then when Paul uses the second person plural, you, he is referring to the primarily Gentile members of the Ephesian church. Now, Each usage of these words has to be determined by its context, right? That's one of the rules of interpretation that we use, is we interpret each verse in its own context. But this is a general guide. As you read through Ephesians, if you see we without any modifier, it's referring to all Christians. If you see we with some sort of a distinguishing explanation, like we who were the first to hope in Christ, then it's referring primarily to Jewish believers, and then the second person plural, you, throughout the book primarily refers to Gentile Ephesian believers. Now, I want to help you to see what the significance of this is. If you look on the screen, we had talked before in the introduction about the dividing wall that had existed in the Old Covenant between the Jews and the Gentiles. They were divided. They were at enmity with one another. They were separate. They were two different groups. It was us and them. And never the two would interact, right? In their minds, if you heard a Jewish person using we or our or us, you could be sure that he had no Gentiles in mind. Gentiles were you or them and vice versa. But here's why Paul's interchange of the we and the you and the us is so shocking because what he is doing is he is teaching that these two formerly separate groups have been united in one body in Christ. Throughout the letter, he uses we and you and our to teach that the old distinctions, the old divisions, the old walls have been obliterated by Christ when he united Jew and Gentile into one body, the church, when he grafted the Gentiles in to the covenant. I want you to think about Chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, just to try to help you visualize it in this way. 
In our passage, in verses 3 through 11, he uses the words we and our to refer to all Christians, everyone that's in Christ, right? So that's verses 3 through 11. It's, it's all of us who are in Christ. Then in verse 12, he introduces this modifier, right? He says, we, and then the modifier, who were the first to hope in Christ. So now he's talking about those Jewish believers, the first ones to hope in in the Messiah. And then in verse 13, he talks about then the Ephesian Gentiles, you also. And then look at the switch back in verse 14. So we have, you know, we Jews who were the first to hope in Christ. Then verse 13, you Gentiles also heard the gospel and believed. And then in verse 14, look at the switch back to we, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory right now it's back to all of us together so we and that we meaning everybody and then we who are the first to hope and then you also and now here we are all again together this pattern is repeated throughout the book look at at chapter 2 verses 10 through 14 He says in chapter 2, verse 10 through 14, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Right? This is the we, all Christians. Then look at verse 11. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, right? So there's you, the Gentiles in the flesh. And he goes on to talk about how they were cut off and all of these things and they were separate from the group called the circumcision, which is referring to the old covenant Jews in the second part of chapter two, verse 11. But then when we get down to verse 13, he says, but now in Christ, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace, right? And there's that word our, which is referring then again to all Christians. So here we have again this switch from we to you to our. And Paul is teaching them that these two formerly bitter enemies, separate groups now have been united together into one body. And most clearly we see this in chapter 2, verse 17. Look at this. It says, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, right? You who are far away were the Gentiles. We who were near are the Jews. But look at what it says next in verse 18. For through him we, right? And now's the we that's referring to all of us together in Christ. We both have our access in one Spirit to the Father. We, right, is you and us together in Christ. By this back and forth, Paul is teaching a powerful truth, the unity of the body. Now, this maybe seemed a little bit too grammatical for a Palm Sunday morning. What, why did I do this? Why did I do this? Because... I think it's exceptionally practical for our times. And this theme is coming up again and again in the book of Ephesians, this idea of unity in the body of Christ, of all tribes, tongues, and nations and nationalities united in one with former divisions obliterated, with former enmities erased, with all of the demands of justice satisfied by the blood of Christ. And in our world, there is so much us and them language. It's the Jew versus the Arab. It's the American versus the Russian. It's the white versus black. Those are the sad realities of the divisions in our world. But Paul is teaching us by his own example and by his language that that's not the way it should be among us. It should not be this way in the body of Christ. We shouldn't even talk this way. He doesn't deny that serious divisions exist in the world. He doesn't deny that those, those divisions used to exist, but he explains that Christ's blood has obliterated it once and for all. 
had the privilege last year of visiting a church pastored by a friend of mine in Baltimore. It's an interesting church because in terms of its ethnicity because the uh, senior pastor is black, the associate pastor is white, the church is about a third black, a third white, and a third other ethnicities. And Pastor George is there and they just have this incredible loving unity as I just so enjoyed my visit there. And I asked him, you know, you know, this is a part of Baltimore that has, a, has had a lot of racial divisions and, and even violence in its past. And I asked Pastor George, how did you do it? How did you get across all of those barriers? You know, what was the secret to it? And you know what he did? He looked at me, Pastor George looked at me and said, he looked at me kind of like, that's a, like the silliest question, right? I mean, he just had this weird look on his face, like, why do I ask such a silly question? He said, bro, we just preach the gospel, dude. Like, when, he said, when people get saved, they're united into one body by Christ, and the more they grow to love Christ, the more they grow to love each other. So we just preach the word. It's not exactly rocket science. You know, that's the exact same answer that a man named Dr. Erez Saref, who's the president of Israel College of the Bible, gave me when I was sitting in his living room in Israel. At Israel College of the Bible, there are Jews and Palestinians, both believers in Christ, who study together and worship together and fellowship together in incredible peace and harmony as brothers, while outside on the street, all of those groups are killing each other. And I asked Dr. Saref, how did you do it? And he says, well, we didn't. Christ did. We preach the gospel, and Christ unites people into one family. Now let's go back to verses 13 through 14 and with our remaining few minutes I want to look at the things that verses 13 and 14 say that the Holy Spirit does, right? We've, we've been talking about what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, the first thing he, we just got done talking about is he unites us in one body, right? Show me a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit and I will show you a man who loves the nations, his own nation and all of the other peoples of the world. But what else does the Holy Spirit do for us? Look in verse 13. It says, In him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Right? The Holy Spirit, the first thing that he does in the life of the believer is he brings the gospel to you. He brings the gospel to a sinner. A sinner hears, right? He listens. In him, after listening to the message of truth, This is the work of the Spirit. In Acts 1.8, we read that the Holy Spirit, he comes and he gives power to people so that they would be witnesses. He says, you know, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit calls out witnesses and empowers them and sends them locally and internationally to take the gospel to the very ends of the earth. And because the Holy Spirit empowered witnesses, the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation got to your ears. You heard it. And do you realize how miraculous and marvelous that is? Do you rejoice over the fact that you had the incredible, wonderful, eternity-changing opportunity to hear the gospel. Since the beginning, Satan has tried with all of his might to prevent the messenger from getting the message to the ears of the sinner. He either tries to stop the messenger through persecution and barriers, or he tries to pervert the message. And he's used all of his power and the power of some of the most most incredible empires in history to try to eliminate the Bible, to try to stamp out the preaching of the gospel, to put anti-blasphemy laws and anti-proselytizing laws in many countries of the world to make it illegal for one person to tell another person about how they can come to salvation through faith in Christ. He sent waves of persecution through Nero and Diocletian in the Roman Empire, in modern times through communist persecutions under Mao and Stalin, and many other attempts he has made to stop the message from getting to the ear of the sinner and yet somehow you heard you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation I like to remind uh, when an audience is primarily of European origin like this one is I like to remind you of what it took to get the gospel to you the blistered feet of the early missionaries who were coming from the Middle East to Europe 
the bloody corpses of untold thousands of early missionaries who were martyred by our demon-worshipping ancestors. The thousands who were massacred and burned at the stake and filleted alive during the Counter-Reformation and the Inquisition in Europe in order to preserve that message of truth, the gospel of our salvation. It was carried over the ocean by religious refugees who were in these little wooden boats filled with human puke. It somehow survived starvation, error, hypocrisy, false teaching, and everything else that Satan has thrown at it in the course of our own country's history. And despite all of that, all of Satan's best effort, somehow it got to your ears. That's a miracle. That is the work of the Holy Spirit for you. You heard, and that is a miracle. When's the last time you thanked the Lord that you even got to hear the message? You even got to hear. And when's the last time your heart was broken over those who still have not heard? Beautiful feet brought the gospel to you. Now it's your turn to take it to your neighbors, your coworkers, and even to distant nations. And next week we have a beautiful opportunity to do that just by handing someone an invitation. What else does the Spirit do? Look at verse 4. 13, it says, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, right? So first the sinner hears the message, and then through the work of the Spirit in his heart, he believes that message, right? In chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says very clearly, for grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The Holy Spirit works in the heart of the believer to bring conviction, to soften him, to woo him to the Savior, to lead him to Christ. Sometimes we use the phrase, hey, let's try to lead someone to Christ. Well, if we really think about it, it's not us who are leading someone to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit using us as an instrument. He is the one leading the person to Christ. C.S. Lewis gave a powerful illustration once. He talked about a child who wanted to buy a gift for his father, and so he goes to his father and says, you know, father, can I have sixpence, right? A a few pennies. I want to buy you a present for your birthday. So the father gives him the sixpence. Child goes out, buys a present for his father, gives it to the father. This is what we do with our faith, right? Faith itself is a gift from God that we give back to him. If you're a parent, it's not too hard for you to understand this concept, right, of faith being a gift. Think about this if you're a parent. You gave your child life. You fed her. You changed her diaper. It was you who bought the crayons. You who gave her the construction paper. You're the one who taught her how to hold the crayon and how to color. But when that child brings that little picture with stick figures and hearts. It fills your heart with joy and it goes on that last remaining spot on your refrigerator, right? All that we have and all that we are and even our faith is a gift from God. The question is, what are we doing with those gifts? What picture are you coloring with what you've been given? Are you returning to the Lord that Hosanna in the highest praise Or are you withholding the love, the gratitude, and the obedience that your heavenly Father deserves? And I hasten to add, maybe someone is even here today. We're going to target next week's message towards unbeliever, but there may be someone here who has listened to the message of truth, the gospel of salvation, but has not believed. That's the next step for you, right? In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. If you have never believed, you need to do so. That is the next step for you. What's the third thing that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer? He seals us. He seals us. When a person believes, he is sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? Having also believed, verse 13 says, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, we don't use seals very much in our culture today, right? It's kind of electronic signatures and all of this. But when I lived in Ukraine, 
seals were very important, right? If you had a deed to your apartment, it meant nothing unless there was this official seal with kind of a hand-sewn binding and wax and then this stamp and this seal and a signature that kind of went through the, the seal. And then if you had a government records office, they would take the doors where the records are and they would put two wax seals on either side and connect them by this little metal uh, piece of, uh, of, of iron so that if anyone opened the door to tamper with those files, they would break that wax seal. I mean, even to get our, our kid's birth certificate, we had to prove that we were married, and so we produced our marriage certificate, and they looked at it and thought, what, what, what is this meaningless piece of paper with somebody's signature on it? Where's the stamp? Where's the seal? It's not official. And so we had to go and get this big yellow golden seal put on it by the Secretary of State in order to, for them to acknowledge our marriage certificate as genuine. Right? The seal around the world and in biblical times meant something is genuine. It is official and it is secure. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we see what we were sealed towards. It says in chapter 4, verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. And what were we sealed for? For the day of redemption. When you believed, God gave you the Holy Spirit, and the giving of the Holy Spirit was his seal put on your heart all the way until the day of redemption. He's saying, you are mine until the day in which I come back for you. In Exodus, we read that the high priest in the Old Covenant had a seal that he that he would keep on his heart. And on that seal was written the words, holy to the Lord, right? Holy to the Lord was written on the seal that the high priest would wear. What's interesting is that Herodotus, the ancient historian, says that pagans used to get tattoos or even branding and they would take the name of the false god that they worshipped and they would brand themselves or tattoo the name of that false god on their body as a way of indicating that they belonged to that god. So think about this. Paul is writing to Ephesians and many of them had come to Christ out of the worship of Artemis, out of the worship of these pagan gods. And as they read this letter, when they read, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, they could probably look down on their own hand or their own chest and see an old tattoo or an old brand that used to say belongs to Artemis, this false god who couldn't save. And he is coming to them and saying, look, you too, you pagans who used to worship these false gods, you heard the message of truth, you believed it, and when that happened, you were sealed in him by the Holy Spirit. God put his seal of ownership on you. You no longer belong to the world. You no longer belong to Artemis. You no longer belong to those false gods. You belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit has sealed you and sealed you all the way to the day of redemption. Fourth and finally, we find out that the Holy Spirit is a pledge that guarantees that we will be preserved to the end as God has promised. Look at verse 14. It says the Holy Spirit, right? Verse 13 says, calls it, even calls him the Holy Spirit of promise. And verse 14 says, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of God of his glory. This word pledge is an interesting one because it has survived from ancient Greek all the way to modern Greek. Do you know how modern Greeks, if you go to Greece today and you were to pronounce this word to them, do you know what instant association would come in their minds? This word pledge is the word that they use to describe an engagement. And their word for engagement ring is this word plus the word ring. Right? The pledge ring is what they use this word to describe. It's a groom who is pledging, promising, and giving a symbol of his pledge to his bride that he will come back and he will marry her. 
Christ promised the church that she would be his bride, that he would return for her and bring her safely to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he gave her a pledge before he left. He sent the Holy Spirit to be the pledge. I mean, you know, talk about a million dollar rock, right? You know, talk about a rock that glistens, right? He gave not just some little piece of metal, but he actually gave the Holy Spirit as his pledge to the church that he will come back for us. The Holy Spirit, it says, is given as a pledge, a down payment, an earnest, a guarantee of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own people. It's interesting in verse four, chapter 4, verse 30, when it talks about this again, Paul at the end of his epistle says this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, right? When in the context of chapter 4, he's talking about all these practical kinds of sins, whether it's stealing or anger or bitterness or all of these things that fill our hearts and come out of our mouths. And he even talks about, of course, joking in chapter 5, verse 4. He's saying, look, don't, don't live unholy. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was given as a pledge of this glorious inheritance. Right? Don't take something that was given and don't take someone as precious and as present as the Holy Spirit and then grieve him by polluting his temple, by using his temple for evil. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He now indwells you. He is with you. You are never alone. There's no such things as private sins. There's only things that you do and private sins that you do with only one witness, the Holy Spirit of God. So how you live both in public and in private needs to give joy and honor the Holy Spirit. Paul, in talking about this same idea about the Spirit being a pledge, says in 2 Corinthians 5, therefore we have as our ambition to be pleasing to him. I want you to think as we close about all of the blessings that we've studied in verses 3 through 14 of Ephesians 1. Right? Blessed be, verse 3, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 8, he lavished his grace on us. And then we have been given a pledge of a glorious inheritance, guaranteeing that God will redeem his own possession, his people, to the praise of his glory. And I remind you that that's how each of these three major sections ends, with to the praise of his glory. As Christ was coming into Jerusalem, the people said, Hosanna, blessed is he, right? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Paul says in chapter one, verse three, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ because he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We have been given so much in him. Let's give him the glory this morning in prayer. Lord, our hearts are so filled Lord, with just even a few brief minutes of contemplating, Lord, all that we have in Christ, what the Father has done for us, what the Son has done for us, what the Holy Spirit has done for us, what we have in Christ, Lord, the lavishing of grace. Oh, Lord, we say together with the children who praised you in the temple and the crowds that praised you on the, tri on the road to Jerusalem, who took off their cloaks and laid them before you and waved the palm branches, we say, Hosanna, blessed are you, our Lord, our God, our Savior. We thank you that we are yours, that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit who guarantees our inheritance. Oh, how grateful we are, Lord. Help us never to grieve your spirit. Help us to never live a life that contradicts our identity in Christ. We give you praise on this Palm Sunday in Jesus' name.